the last episode was about God giving us eyes to see when we are not understanding what he's doing in our lives and what's going on. Well, right after I recorded that, it seems like every, like when I take my time alone with God, all of my devotionals, everything that he's just talking, like speaking to me, has something to do with vision and sight. And so he's trying to give me a better understanding. And as he's teaching me and showing me, I'm going to share with y'all. So I got a quick little story, right? So I told y'all also on last week's episode that I grocery shop for people, right? Um, and deliver it to their door. And um, when I was pick, doing a delivery, it's in a familiar area. Um, how do I say this? Okay, so I knew the street was a familiar place, um, but I didn't. I thought it was one of my regular, <laughs> one of my regulars who had ordered because I saw the street name and the way the order looked. It definitely seemed like it was her and her husband's order, but. It ended up being somebody else further up the hill down the street. And if you all are, are familiar with an area that doesn't have street lights, once the sun goes down, it takes only a few seconds, then it's pitch black, right? So I typically call people in advance, let them know an ETS, a call or send a text. But this time I just felt led to call. So I tried to call a lady and say, you know, hey, I'll be there at this by this time. Please make sure you have your porch light on, you know, so I can see, you know, good and leave your stuff at your door. But she didn't answer. So I get closer. And as I pull up into her driveway, I see this little lady um, hanging out of her window at the top, you know, upstairs, her upstairs window. And when I opened up my door, I parked my car, opened up the door. And she was like, uh, she said, we have a bit of a problem. I was like, don't worry about it, ma'am, you know, because in my mind, it just was like, okay, maybe um, she got my, because I, I did send a message because I couldn't get through to her through phone. I sent her a message and tell her, you know, can you please ensure that the porch lights, that, that your porch light is on, that there's some light out there that way I can see good since it's getting dark. I don't want it to get dark on me as I'm, you know, leaving your stuff at your door. And so when I got there, she was like, we have a bit of a problem. So I'm assuming she got my message, tried to turn the light on. Maybe her bulb was out, her switch is out or something. And so I was like, you know what, ma'am, don't worry about it. I'll just turn my car in a way where it's facing your door and I'll turn my headlights on. That way, if it gets dark, you know, I still have that light shining towards the door. And she was like, oh, no, no, no. There's a dead deer in my door. And so... I'm like, this lady must have, you know, um, an illness where she thinks that something's there that's not. And so I'm like, oh, no, ma'am, you know, there's nothing at your door. She's like, no, there's a dead deer at my door. Because I was looking, I'm like, there's nothing at her door. But I, I had to take a second look. Look, I had to gaze upon <laughs> and realize it was a dead deer at her door. So I'm like, I'm already in panic, right? I'm used to seeing deer, especially somebody who likes to hike. I do a lot of hiking. I'm used to seeing deer, but I'm not used to seeing a dead deer, especially not at nobody's front door. So I'm like, oh, ma'am, I'm in panic mode. Ma'am, um, what would you like for me to do? Like, wh like, where do you want me to sit this at? Because I am not walking towards your front door. And so she's like, <laughs> she's like, I'll call the city. They're going to come out here and get it. Um, but they probably won't be out here it's tomorrow. And I'm like, hey, it's getting dark. And my, I stopped thinking logically. My logical mind was not working. All I could think about was dead deer. If another animal set that there, then it, it, it left its food in the air. It, it's, it's in the area because its food is in the area, right? And I don't want to be here when it comes back to, to eat, when it comes to get its food. I don't want it to think that I'm somebody it needs to fight for its food, right? So I'm like, lady, I gotta go. Like, we need to make this quick. <laughs> we need to come up with uh, come up with your decision, whatever we're doing, real quick. Like, this has needs to move fast, right? And so she was like, Do you, can you walk around the deer and set it on the other side of the door? And I'm like, oh no, ma'am, <laughs> I can leave it right here at your garage. But there, like, there's, I can't carry your groceries. I can't walk around the dead deer and leave it at the door. Like, 
I'm scared, right? And it's dark and I need to move quick. There was a, it was a, a scared person trying to walk around a dead animal and I don't, I, I can't do dead things. Um, it just was like, mm-mm. my mind just like, mm-mm. it's just time for me to get up off, this, off the top of this hill. <laughs> it's time for me to go, IT. <laughs> I have to get your stuff out of my car and I have to leave. So, um, you know, she was trying to negotiate. And I'm like, well, ma'am, are you able to come downstairs? Because if you're able to come down the steps, I will wait for you. And I'll pass you your things and you can take it in your house. She, and, and she's like, no, it's going to take me a minute. You know, so I'm like, why would you even have ordered this with that animal at your door? You know, and so I'm like, I'm willing to wait for you. But she was not coming out that door. I'm like, OK, well. I'm sorry, I'll have to leave your stuff right here by the garage door. And when you get a chance, you know, make it out here, you can, you know, walk out here to your garage, open your garage door, and slide the stuff in, whatever that, whatever it is that you're going to do, I would not be a part of that equation. I have to go before whatever left it at your, left this deer at your door returns. And so I leave, I, I, I stack her stuff. I have OCD anyway. I stack her stuff, her stuff neatly at the garage door, pull on up out of there, right? And as I'm driving back down the hill, I call my sister because I know that she is always by the phone. You know, she's currently uh, um, staying a, a stay-at-home mom. So I'm like, I know Jelaya <laughs> is by the phone. <laughs> I know she got her phone closed. I need to call somebody because they need to hear what just happened to me. So I call my sister and we cackling. And the more we talk and we, you know, talk, discuss the story, now my logical mind is kicking in, right? Because she was like, somebody left it at her door. And I'm like, Janaya, it's, it's left at the door in a way like somebody set it at the door, right? And so we, I started thinking about like how animals operate. If an animal was trying to save it for later, it would be in a place hidden, right? She had no, she had no, um, why can't I think of the name of it? Awning on her, over her door or anything. So it's not like something was cover it, covering it. It was a wide open porch. And so the more we talked about it, I'm like, somebody set that at the door. Because what animal is going to leave it directly at somebody's front door? Somebody set that at that lady's door. I didn't think, I wasn't like one of the people who was about to set, like look for footprints and see what kind of footprints led to her door to drop the animal off or if it was human footprints or an animal, et cetera. But the more I thought about it, it just was like, boom. Somebody set that at that lady. That lady didn't piss somebody off. <laughs> and somebody didn't set that dead deer her door. But it took me taking a second look to realize that there was, in fact, a dead deer her door, right? So God brought this back to my memory as, you know, we were, as he was talking to me about vision and sight, right? So in the story, right? In the story, and hold on, let me make sure I get this right. Mark chapter eight, right? A blind man, some people bring a blind man to Jesus to give him sight right because he wanted vision and um it says in mark chapter 8 that that mark chapter 8 verses 22 it says then they came to bethsaida they brought a blind man to him which is jesus and begged him to touch him he took the blind man by the hand and he brought the blind man out of the village spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him he asked him do you see anything the blind man looked up and said, I see people. They look to me like trees. Again, Jesus placed his hand on the man's eyes and he saw this distinctly. He was cured and he could see everything clearly. Then Jesus said, um, don't return back into the village. You know, now that I've healed you and you can see, don't go back into the village. And so as I'm reading this passage, I kept stopping, right? It was more and more to marinate and process, right? So it says, then they came to Bethsaida. We know that. And verse 23 says that when they were in Bethsaida, Jesus took the blind man's hand and pulled him out of the village, out of Bethsaida. And that is when he began to heal him. He wouldn't heal him in that city. So I'm like, why? Why would you? Why did God have to take him out of the place he was in before he 
gave him what he, you know, gave him the revelation or, you know, the healing, the understanding. And it was because we can see from Luke, what is this? Luke chapter 10, verse 13. It tells us that Luke chapter 10, verse 13 talks about, it's Jesus saying that he's going to curse that city, right? Because he had did all these miracles in the city and they still didn't repent. They still didn't ask, you know, for, for try to ask for forgiveness or try to change their lives around, even though they were seeing like all of these miracle signs and wonders and that Jesus was who he said he was, right? So the, what the Holy Spirit was showing me is that he took, Jesus took the man's hand and pulled him out of the city to heal him and told him not to return back to the city. Don't walk back in that city now that I've healed you because he was cursing the city. He didn't want that man to take the hit or be affected, right? Not only that, he didn't want the people in the city. He was no longer trying to prove to them, prove a point to them. He was now now past proving a point. I'm past that that mark of trying to show you the miracle size of one. Y'all need to see nothing else. <laughs> Y'all don't need to see anything else going on, right? But another part that stuck out to me was that back in Mark chapter 8, it says that when after Jesus laid his hands on him the first time, he asked the man, did he, did he see anything? And the man said, I see people and they look to me like trees walking. So I'm like, why did it take, you know, Jesus two different times to lay his hands on him? for him to be able to see clearly. And I had to stop and process at the fact that the, the part where it says that I see people, but they look to me like trees walking. So then I'm sitting there trying to figure out like, why are the people, why are, why is it that these people look like trees walking to him? So I tried to squinch my eyes, right? I go on YouTube, I pull up a video of people walking and I squinch my eyes real tight. And I'm like, nah, people don't look like, people don't look like trees walking to me what is it that was making him see this right and so then like the holy spirit was just like because <laughs> he is chatty and he didn't give us understanding especially when we're seeking it he showed me he said keep your eyes open but take your hand and put it over your eyelids your hand is so much more stronger than your eyelids so it's going to force your eyelids down. Your eyes are going to be straining to stay open because your eye, you're trying to keep your eyes open. Your brain is trying, to, your brain knows that you want your eyes open. And so the, it's just going to be a very little part of that very little edge of your eye is going to start, it still sees, but doesn't see clearly, right? And that's when I started seeing people elongated like trees. And I'm like, oh, this is what he was seeing. So it was like a weight, like something heavy holding, holding like his eyelids down, keep like putting pressure on it to keep him from seeing clearly, right? A weight, right? And so then the Holy Spirit just started showing me how a weight could be, how, how we may have a vision, right? We have vision, right? But God can give us a vision of something because this is bigger than just looking at something, right? We have vision and as we are like our eyelids, God created our eyelids to protect our vision. That's their job to keep anything from getting in our eye that can cause any like great harm. It's, it's a shield of protection. And so naturally our eyelids, again, is to is our our eyelids are there to protect our eyes but if something comes and puts a weight over what is what was created to protect us to protect the vision then it make it strains it makes it harder to see clearly to see what see what's going on clearly right when a weight is trying to come so i in, immediately when i was thinking about that lady and that deer i'm like this, it was some like everything about it just was like mm something is off but it felt like it felt like because she is I don't know how to explain it spiritually first of all these lies what six years have taught me how real 
witchcraft is, right? How like demonic spirits and how people be doing all kind of stuff, right? That's unholy, okay? Um, and so not only am I very sensitive spiritually, but I have a heightened awareness too of like, even if I haven't processed completely what it is, something just be like, uh-uh, you know, well, not something, that's God, it's the Holy Spirit, like, uh-uh, like, some, like something is extremely off here. You need to get up out of this situation. And so as I was thinking about, I, I don't know for sure exactly what was going on, but that deer being laid at that woman's door, either it seemed to me like either somebody was doing something to her um, to try to block her because she was not going to be able to open her door, her front door, the way it was placed until it, that deer got moved, right? Um, or that she had been into something and somebody trying to get her back, you know, either way it go. It was some 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 very negative uh, demonic stuff going on, right? But anyways, so God was showing me that weight, right? That, you know, we can't see stuff clearly because a weight can be over our eyes and, and preventing what was supposed to be there just to keep a covering over the vision, to protect the vision. Something can come and put a weight over that to keep us from seeing stuff clearly, right? And I also started thinking about, it says in Mark chapter 8 too, in the same passage about the blind man. Right. So it says that the man was it says that. Hold on. Let me make sure I get this right. Um, OK. It says that the man was cured and he can see everything clearly. Right. So I wrote a couple of notes. Uh, right. It's, it's Mark chapter eight, verse twenty five. It says, then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again, and his eyes were opened. His sight was completely restored, right? So God had restored it a little bit. It was restored um, to an extent off, the God, off Jesus putting his hands on him the first time, but it was completely restored after the second time. And I'm like, restored? This man had to have had vision before. He wasn't born blind. It doesn't tell us that he was born blind. He must have had, he must have been able to see before, but something came and came and prevented that gave him complete blindness. Not just where you can see people as trees, but it put him in a position in a situation where he had complete blindness, right? And I'm like, okay, wait, wait, like I'm I was, I was, I was this made me real chatty because either like when God gives me these passages sometimes he is trying to show me something that's going on in my life. Other times it's somebody I'm encountering or interacting with or somebody that's close that I may need to share this with. Right. Um, and then I was also like, right. He had to have not been born blind because it says that he could see, he, he looking at people and he could see that they look like trees. How did he know what a tree looked like if he was blind? Because he had to have had sight at one point, right? That was further confirmation that he could see before, but something caused his blindness, right? Something caused, there There was something that kept him where his eyes were completely, his eyelids were completely keeping him from seeing clear, like keeping his, 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 eye, his, his vision and his eyeballs from seeing clearly, right? And so I'm processing this even more, right? trying to figure out like god what are you trying to show me what are you trying to tell me right um so we're going to go to another we're going to go to another chapter right i told you i was studying genesis genesis chapter 27 isaac was deceived by his son jacob into getting his um getting up getting a promise from his father right and so genesis chapter 27 the very first verse says one day when Isaac was old and turning blind he called for Esau which was Jacob's twin brother his older son and said my son yes father Esau replied and Isaac said I am an old man now and I don't know when I may die take your bow and quiver full of arrows and go out into the open and, and hunt for for your for wild game but if we just stick to verse one it says 
that he was old and he was turning blind, meaning he couldn't see clearly. So when, I don't know if you all are familiar with the story, but when Jacob, the other, the other twin, because there's a, a set of twins, Esau and Jacob are Isaac's children. And Jacob tricked his father, Isaac, out of getting his father's out of, out of getting the firstborn inheritance while Esau was out hunting and throughout the passage Isaac kept saying come here let me smell you come here let me feel you I'm listening to your voice but your voice don't sound too much like Esau's because something kept knocking at him kept making him feel like I don't think that you are the son that you are telling me you are Right. Because Jacob went all he went out his way to try to make his skin feel like his brothers, trying to smell like his brothers, trying to cook like his brother. All of these things to try to deceive his father out of getting this promise. So he went above and beyond. Right. Above and beyond. It takes so much to try to deceive somebody going completely out the way to try to persuade them to believe something that is not true. Right. Um, when Jacob and Rebecca could have easily saved themselves so much time by just letting God work out his promises because God had promised the blessing to Jacob. But instead of him and his mother waiting for God to, you know, give him what he promised, they went, he wouldn't deceive his father. Right. So what we see here is that is Isaac teaching us that when something seems off, trust it. Right. And even when somebody is trying to persuade you into believing in the lie, right? I also started thinking like Jesus didn't want that man to go back into that city because, for instance, say he's been blind and he asked somebody to paint his door yellow and he hires a contractor and they tell him, yeah, we painted your door yellow. You know, here we know. Just give us payment for it. But he goes back home and he realized that door is red, right? He's been tricked. He probably, he'll probably end up cutting up because you told me one thing and I'm looking at something different. I was, I, he could have easily been deceived, right? These people are already was a little off. But anyway, <laughs> I was, I went, I went, I went down into the, into the deep, right? But most importantly, we know that Jesus didn't want him to go back in, into that town because he was going to curse that town, right? But again, Isaac is teaching us, you know, not to not to believe the lie. He questioned it so many times whether that was truly Esau that he was having an encounter with. But instead, he just went off of what he was being told because he couldn't see clearly his vision. His vision wasn't too good. So he just went off of, you know, the fact that Jacob just kept saying, I, I'm, I'm Esau, I'm Esau. Even though something just kept, you know, knocking at him, tapping him like, that ain't who that is. <laughs> you are being lied to, right? You are being deceived. And so also in Matthew chapter 20, we see two blind men coming to Jesus to be healed, right? And they come and they're crying out and they're like, Lord, you know, we want to see. And Jesus like, what y'all want me to do? for? What, what do y'all want me to do for y'all? And they're like, Lord, we just, you know, we want to see, we want you to give us vision. And Jesus felt so sorry for them. And he touched their eyes and instantly they could see. Then they followed him. So even if we're in a situation where somebody is trying to deceive us into thinking that it is dark outside, when we can clearly, feel, we can, if we can't see clearly, we can feel the sun shining on us. And somebody's trying to con continue to tell us, to try to persuade us into thinking, no, no, it's it's night outside. It's really not day. It, the sun is not shining. It's dark, you know. We can ask Jesus himself, you know what? This person, like something keeps telling me that what you're trying to tell me is not that, like it's, it does, it's, it's not, it's not adding up. The math, not math. So you can go to Jesus. Hey, God, give me sight. Help me to see. And out of his compassion and love for us, he will give you them eyes to see every single time so that you don't get up, get caught up in some stuff or get or get deceived at minimal, deceived at minimal 
into believing that the coast is clear and it's okay and it's safe for you to be somewhere that you, that you're really not right that's really that really can cause us great harm right so again just like last episode we can we can pray god give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you're not only what you're doing in our lives but give us eyes to see what like what's, what you are doing on this earth and what is what's going on around us so that we also aren't being deceived and being okie doke right i have a major pet peeve a major pet peeve i do not like nobody like i i can clearly see the truth but somebody is 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 insistent on trying to prove to me the lie right when i'm looking the truth in its face dead in the face i'm looking at i'm looking at my answer i'm looking at the answer to all my questions but you're trying to tell me something totally different that grinds my gears because i feel like you're trying to insult my intelligence and also what is it that not only i realize that you are so insistent on your personal game which is why you're trying to lie we tell lies because we feel like it's beneficial for us right so not only are you insistent on your personal gain, but how dedicated to this lie are you? Are you so dedicated to it that you will allow me to be be put in harm's way? And so that's why we need to go to the Lord, go to Jesus, talk to the Holy Spirit. Jesus, give me eyes to see. Give me eyes to see what you are doing. I love you all in real life.